afternoon, everybody. Hi, welcome back to Lunch and Learn, the Museum of American Finance. I'm David Cameron, the president. Uh, and today we hear from a good friend of the museum, uh, Damien Craig O. He is an independent historian, but he studied history throughout his life. He did his undergraduate work at Hillsdale, and then he went to Colorado State University for his master's. Architecture is also in his blood as he worked at his father's firm. And Damien is now involved in historic narration. And his two most recent projects are for the new Benedict Arnold Walking uh, Trail that is in Norwich, Connecticut. And then interestingly for us, he is the lead voice on our new walking tours upstairs in the museum. Uh, one quick note, of course, if you could please turn off your cell phones if they're not already. And it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Damien. Well, this is uh, something of a dream come true because, as David noted, um, I worked for uh, my father for parts of 20 years between 1986 and when he passed away in 2005 up in Connecticut. And uh, I remember when I was getting my master's in history, one of my professors always uh, you know, suggested to me, you have to have a snazzy title. And I thought, well, I wasn't going to go with architectural landmarks of really 20th century Manhattan because that would be kind of generic. So I thought, got to come up with something snazzy, and I thought, well, people like what's popular. What's popular? Well, Mad Men, very popular show, and Down Abbey. And I thought, you know, I'll be talking about some pretty mad people in that age of Down Abbey, in other words, early 20th century. So there's my catchy title. Architectural Landmarks of Early 20th Century Manhattan, meaning that I can hit on things that are other than skyscrapers, but in case you're wondering the focus, spoiler alert, is mostly uh, going to be skyscrapers. But we have a few surprises woven in, mostly from the madness of demolition. So there's, uh, I just want to give a, authors give tributes in books, so I thought this is the first time I've ever done this. Um, I just want to give a tribute to my father. There on the left, there we are in our matching um, camel hair coats, I guess. Uh, back in the day, at some Thanksgiving or Christmas or something. Um, he was Yale, class of 51, Brantford College, architecture, School of Architecture in 54, practiced uh, architecture in Connecticut for 50 years. He did meet Frank Lloyd Wright, that was one of his uh, enjoyable moments. He also was a professional pianist, um, and his claim to fame is that he designed, he was the architect on the Mayflower Inn in Washington, Connecticut. This is up in, in Litchfield Hills. And that was a three-year project running from 89 to 91, and this photo is from uh, its completion there. Uh, I happened to work on that building, uh, both in the design phase and then in the construction phase. And that was a wonderful, fun challenge for me to get to do professionally, to see how a building is really put together. But it actually includes, like we're going to be talking about today, steel. There is steel in there to carry some of these crazy spans. We had these bedrooms that were over huge spans like the lobby and you can only imagine what I think it's going to take that is, is steel or had it been years later we might have worked with you know a, a family of uh, glue lamps you know and all these composite materials it's always fun to open with a joke so I'll tell you a joke about the construction project there was a lot of heat you know we'll go with the theme of Mad Men in this in this entire lecture today and um, the madness of the owner he was the world's largest collector of Rothko at the time here from the city and this was his love, that he wanted to resurrect this dilapidated hotel and make it this grand new five-star hotel, which it has become. It's changed hands several times since 1990, but it has a wonderful reputation. And um, he's putting a lot of heat on my dad's architectural engineering firm, Krugo Associates Architects and Engineers. Uh, they're having a conference. You can imagine all the, the generals are in their circle having their conference, right? And he says, you know, why can't we get this done faster? Why can't we have more people put on this? You know, we can't, you know, why can't we make this, you know, deadline sooner? And one of the, uh, my dad was 65 at the time. He had seen and heard everything, you know, in, in his all his years in architecture and his equally experienced senior engineer said, well, it's kind of like this, no matter how many chickens you have and how many eggs you have, you know, it still takes time to hatch. In other words, you, you know, the eggs are only gonna hatch so quickly, if, no matter how many chickens you put on them. So that, uh, it was a cute moment that just sort of took all the um, heat away from the moment with the, uh, the owner. He thought that was cute. Um, these are the murals that inspired this actual presentation uh, that I'm giving today. Um, I had this aha moment. I'm in the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society. We have, our acronym is AHA. So I had my aha moment when uh, a friend of mine, an engineering friend no less, here in New York City and I met for drinks 
at uh, Liberty Tower, which I'm going to mention briefly later on, uh, one of the great old historic skyscrapers of its day. And in the lobby, as you walk in, on the left and right side in the stairwell there, are these two murals depicting what the skyline would have looked like in that area in 1909, here in the financial district, the FIDI as we call it. And you can see there's this building that many of us are not familiar with, unless you're old enough, the Singer Building, which I'll be talking about on the left. And what I kind of like is the Jules Verne sort of style, you know, motif with, you know, the, the hot air balloon and the aircraft, these early aircraft, and of course the Brooklyn Bridge figuring prominently on the right side. So that is what inspired me, and I thought, you know, it'd be really good to do a talk. Looking back a hundred years ago, like if we were to turn back to 1916, what would we see? What would New York look like? And we're going to see that a couple times today. But this is what we're looking at right now, and I think that's the other point of my talk, is the buzz is around what's going up. The skyscrapers, the glass boxes, and the, the wedges, as I call them, that go up. And I have to confess, I'm a traditionalist, uh, I'm nostalgic, that's one of the other themes of this talk is nostalgia, but I have to say that the building on the far right, the Bank of America Tower by Bryan Park, it's one of my favorite new construction, new, new towers. I happen to think it's very charming in its own way, uh, creative. And there's some one, wonderful ones in the 80s and 90s in Chicago and Philadelphia as well. But by and large, we're seeing a lot of under-creative, maybe, uh, wedges and boxes going up, and you know we need to be aware that this is going to change the skyline, and in some cases, the view you're gonna have from where you live or where you work or as you commute down. So um, that would be an interesting evolution in itself. So we wanna appreciate what gets lost, which are these. I mean, this is hardly recognizable, right? It is lower Manhattan, but if we didn't have that point, we wouldn't be able to tell, oh, look, that's the fire eye. And the, the theme, I think, here visually, besides it's black and white, um, is um, pyramids. You're going to see a lot of buildings today uh, in this lecture that are based around the, the pyramids at the tops. That was the common motif. Um, let me just backtrack for one second. We'll, we'll get to this slide. The Bessemer steel pro uh, process that comes along in the 19th century, the elevators, that's great. It's, you've got to have those two to make this all happen, but you also need uh, zoning regulations to allow you to actually build what you're now able to build. So once they were able to have the elevators, once they had the Bessemer steel, the next thing is 1892. That's when everything changes. Revolutionary year, this long forgotten. New York City altered the building regulations allowing skeleton construction and curtain walls. So we're gonna have that skeleton construction of steel. The load is created um, by building uh, the internal skeleton that we're gonna see. And then the stone, of course, then is no longer structurally. You don't have to have granite or some other strong stone. And that, of course, allows buildings to get taller, and the architectural terracotta is that ceramic skin. And we're going to see that again and again and again in each of these buildings, okay? And a good early example, you know, you look at the outside of this and you think there's no steel involved, and yet 1893, see, right as soon as the alterations can be made in the, the laws in 1892, you're able to build the Waldorf Hotel. This is the earlier half of the then famous Waldorf story, the original. There are a lot of these, we're going to talk about the original versions of things before they're replaced by a subsequent more modern version. This is the Waldorf, which will later be, soon be uh, dwarfed by the adjacent Astoria Hotel. And the photo on the right is actually not from 1893, because you can tell the Helmsley building and other buildings are in the background, so this is for the second generation Waldorf Astoria. But I just wanted to show that um, customer service was ludicrous, even for the, the workers, and just to show you that you really could use the steel to build a hotel like you have there on the left, which is kind of in that French Renaissance revival style. And unfortunately, one of the buildings that we will later find out is demolished in the 1920s. Waldorf Astoria. So they merge because next door the Astoria goes up and it's so huge they decide, okay, and then we're gonna merge these two with a long hallway that's an entire city block long. Look at that. I mean, just at the ceiling height and the detail, the craftsmanship. There's another theme, the incredible craftsmanship that we're gonna see in all this. And a lot of that is on, I'd say it's still in homes, but you don't see it as much now in commercial design. And I wish that that would return if we could somehow get the companies and the labor to understand how to make it financially feasible. The first building we're going to start with is, of course, I have to start here, uh, the Flatiron Building, circa 1901, Fifth Avenue, Broadway, and East 23rd, uh, designed by Daniel uh, Burnham, neo-Renaissance style, and made of terracotta. 
It was um, the tallest building in the neighborhood until the MetLife building came along. Uh, but it wasn't even the tallest building when it was built in 1902 when they began construction because you're going to see there's something that's long been underappreciated that I passed by this morning actually on my way here on Broadway, but we'll get to that building momentarily. Um, and it wasn't the city's first steel uh, frame skyscraper, but its claim to fame was it was the subject of more postcards than any other skyscraper of its era. And here is one of many postcards. And they're adorable. I love, you know, they're, they're hand-colored uh, photographs is what they are. And it gives you the wonderful flat iron effect at that angle, of course, and an idea of what was behind it that have all been demolished since then. That, of course, is the view, an aerial view of what there is today. Um, and, of course, we're going to be talking about several of the buildings because they've always captured my imagination and hopefully yours as well. Of course, I'm talking about the New York Life Gold Leaf Tower on the left the former Metro MetLife, Metropolitan Life Tower in the center, uh, the bell tower, and the flat iron on the right. We're going to see a few of these today. I love the construction photos. You have to, you know, there's working drawings, there's construction drawings, and we have to have working photos. You can't just have the finished product. We want to see what they look like as they're in progress. Uh, because our, our eyes are so used to the finished product, it's rather shocking to see these things under construction and to realize that, yes, indeed, again, there is steel underneath all of that uh, terracotta in each of these buildings. And to also notice that you're not really working uniformly from top to bottom, or of course, bottom to top, that they kind of jump floors. I'd love to know the reason why, but maybe two different squads of workers or something, um, however it progresses. That was the building uh, that was the tallest in the world, in New York City, the Park Row building, 1896 to 99. So that was the one that I referred to made the uh, Flatiron Building the second tallest in its time, people don't realize. And uh, this building is uh, still in existence, thank God, right near uh, St. Paul's and Woolworth and a few other buildings there on Broadway and whatever that corner street is at the angle. <clears throat> and of course, besides uh, buildings, we have other ingenuity, uh, the, the human mind, aircraft at the time, all the rage, right? You know, circa 1903 to 1913. Look at this, like Wright Brothers era of aircraft. It hardly looks airworthy uh, flying over New York City. That would be quite the nerve-wracking flight if I were the pilot or just taking a uh, witness to it. And of course, you have so many wonderful, famous photographs and paintings of the Flatiron, including this famous painting in the rain at night here on the right. The details are interesting. I think that's another thing I wanted to, if you don't already have the appreciation that I wanted to inculcate it or re, uh, reinforce it today, perhaps, and that is the details that we don't always get to see at street level. Now, street level, let's start there, lower left. That's called the cow catcher, and that was not part of the original design, as you might imagine. The owner uh, wanted to have that, the owner being uh, George Fuller. George Fuller was owner of a construction company, and this was this Flatiron building was actually originally called the Fuller Building, but nobody wanted to call it that. They're like, yeah, whatever, it's the Flatiron Building. So that name quickly took uh, took hold. Well, George Fuller had told the architect Daniel Burnham that he wanted to have a little extra income, uh, retail space to help pay for the construction costs. So he put this cow catcher glass wedge on the front. <clears throat> And of course, the other interesting thing I think we're always fascinated with, since we don't get to go into these buildings, unless we are working or know somebody there, what's the view from the inside like? So I give an example on the upper left, looking up at the Empire State Building, up, uh, Broadway, and then you know what's the floor plan like? And a couple examples, I was a couple cases I was able to find uh, floor plans for this in the Woolworth, and I think one other. You can see the interesting designs and how the elevator banks are in the middle. 